Okay, a few points about good practice. I think most of these, I think, are fairly obvious. So I've already said them. Uh, but listen more than you speak. For the beginning, uh, for the, the, the novice interviewer, that's very hard. You're used to conversations where you're used to saying what you think about things. In the research interview, you say very little. Your job is to listen. So listen more, in fact, much more than you speak. And uh, you can always you know, tell a bad interview because you've said too much. Use straightforward, non-threatening questions. Depend, obviously, it depends on what you're talking about and who you're talking to, what's threatening and what, not, what is not threatening. But use straightforward questions, giving the view that, yes, I'm interested in what you're saying, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to make anything of it. Um, it's for my research only. I'm not going to tell anybody. Avoid questions with yes or no answers because you'll simply have to follow it up with tell me more type questions. So try to ask questions that, that, that start with the W's. Where, how, oh, that's an H. Where, who, and so on. The, those kinds of questions. Um, how often, oh, another H. Um, but you know, those are the kind of questions to ask, not the ones that have a yes or no answer. Eliminate cues from the interviewer. So this is back to the point about giving, not giving away your own personal views about things. It's not your opinions as interviewer that matter, it's, it's what the respondent is saying that matters. And so try to avoid giving away whether you agree with their opinions. Simply give away if it's the good thing that they're saying, the right kind of things that, that you want for your, your research. Go with a prepared list. We, we would look at that in a moment, what you've made of that exercise. Make good use of probes. Make sure you follow up when necessary. That's actually a very difficult thing to do in, in interviews. Um, you're having to listen to what people are saying and organise what you're doing at the same time. That's quite hard. But you've got to think through, because that's the only occasion you have. It's the only chance you have very often to ask the questions. So then and there, you must remember to ask those things. That's why the checklist is so important, to make sure you don't forget things. So if you've got them there, you must make sure you ask them and follow up when they don't give the, the detail you need. Um, allow respondents time to think. If they go quiet for a few seconds, that's OK. You can normally tell when someone's trying to think through how to say it or, or trying to remember something that happened to them. Give them time. Don't interrupt too quickly. Uh, give them time to, to think. Enjoy the interview. Be interested in it. I mean, that's one aspect of, of establishing rapport, establishing that, that ease with the respondent, is to enjoy what you're doing. Be interested in what they're saying. You may not agree with what they're saying, but you're interested that they say it and that there are people like that that are doing those kind of things and having those kinds of views and so on. And you should be enjoying it. And the more you enjoy it, the better it will go. Keep a full record. That's back to the recording thing. I mean, you can jot down notes. And, and, and traditionally, of course, well, before we had recorders, that's how you did it. You jotted down notes. Uh, but these days, you tend to record it on, on a, a digital recorder or a video camera. Um, and that's good practice to do that. And of course, maintain confidentiality or anonymity if you need to. So make sure that if you have guaranteed anonymity, that people, you know, people's identity is not revealed in, in your research. How do you develop these skills? Well, practice. You have to do it. Um, and if you're doing a set of interviews in a research project for the first time, it might be a good idea to go out and practice what you're doing on somebody friendly, um, on your partner or uh, practice on your uh, family at home or you know, a good friend. Notice the word good there. It has to be a good friend. <laughs> a bad friend will make you feel foolish. Um, but a good friend will be sympathetic and allow you to ask these silly questions that don't really apply to them. So have a go at it. Uh, pilot interviews, pick one or two people like the people you're going to be interviewing, have a go with them because they'll be similar to the real interviews you're doing. And videotape it and watch the interviews. So, so take what you're doing. And that, that's the most embarrassing episode you can possibly have is to tape yourself, videotape yourself, video record yourself um, doing an interview because you, you find all your kind of mannerisms and, uh, and, and peculiarities come out on the video, both in the voice and in the, the activity. And you're not used to that. You're not used to seeing yourself. Um, it's quite traumatic the first time you do it, but it's very, very useful to see how you manage things and what you did wrong and what you missed out. Coming back to it later on, seeing it, oh my God, why didn't I follow through there? Next time you will, you will remember to follow through at that point. Okay, I mentioned earlier on that you can use technology here quite a bit. Obviously, the recorders are one aspect of that, um, but we can use technology to do the interview. Uh, telephone interviews are very common these days. Um, 
The trouble with television interviews is that they can't be for too long. It's very expensive, actually, to have an hour-long interview and very wearing on, on the ear, the ears, you know, after a, a certain while. Um, and there's no NVC, no non-verbal communication and verbal cues um, to see um, because you can't see the person on the other end of the phone. So usually telephone interviews are fairly short, straightforward topics that are done that way. And, of course, fairly literate responders, not the kind of things you can do with children, for example. Uh, CATI, the, uh, there are lots of these, these kind of terms, but CATI, computer-assisted telephone interviews, are usually strategy interviews. So we have a computer behind the scenes that's generating the questions, and we ask that. Actually, you can do that face-to-face -face as well. Um, CAPI, that's called, a computer-assisted personal interviewing. You actually take the computer with you into the interview situation and ask the questions off the computer. Both of those, both CATI and CAPI, are usually done with structured interviews. So the kind of things you would come with a, a, a survey, a questionnaire survey. Um, face to face unstructured interviews don't normally need a computer to, to help you do that. Um, computer perhaps to record what's going on or a, a digital recorder, uh, but not to lead the questions. You can also interview by email. Um, one or two people researchers have done this. There are pros and cons to that. Um, the big pro, as far as the researcher is concerned, is there's no transcription required because it's come through as text on screen. So you don't need any time listening through to tapes and, and transcribing. The disadvantage, of course, is the, the asynchronous nature of it, the fact that you ask a question, the person's somewhere else in the world, at a different time, they're answering the question and so on. Interviews have used this, um, often find they can ask several questions at once, and the person at the other end, the, the respondent, can actually answer several things at once and send the email through. And it is also a bit restricted about how much can be said. It all depends how good the typist is. Um, I did this with a colleague a few years ago now, and we found that um, uh, respondents who were better typists wrote more, uh, and hence said more, than those who were less good typists. So even little things like that can make a difference to the responses you get. Of course, these days also we can use video conferencing. That gets over a lot of the problems of telephone interviews. It's still remote. Um, you've still got some restrictions on, on the... The, 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 the ability to, to, to establish rapport with them. Uh, but it gives you a lot of other things. Obviously, you've got a picture of them, you can see them, you can get the nonverbal communication to some extent, and you can get recording very quickly as well and easily from that. <coughs> so things like Skype and iChat and so on are, are, are not bad ways of doing that. And um, as I said, you normally record uh, interviews. That's the standard way of doing it these days. And normally it uses the... I'm not going to pick it up because I'll get a click on it, but the digital recorder I've got here is the kind of things that we have here in the school for, for, for loan. You can buy them fairly cheaply now, little um, dictation machines for you know, about £50 upwards. These professional ones are slightly more expensive, a couple hundred quid these cost, but they all produce MP3 recordings that you can easily play back on a computer and listen to and transcribe. Um, face sheet data, keep other, I mean, take a pad with you when you go to the interview so you can jot down other things that you, you, you crop up. Comments you've got, ideas you've got, uh, circumstances of the interview, other issues that weren't talked about, when the person was being evasive, perhaps you can note that down and so on. Um, background information about them. Some points about the recording itself, uh, make sure you use a good microphone. That's probably the most important thing. The one reason why these are expensive is because they have very good microphones in them. Um, they're designed to pick up good quality sound. Um, whereas some dictation machines are, are designed to be held quite close to the mouth. And of course, you can't do that interview. An interview, you normally have the thing in, you know, on the table between you in some sense, so it's some distance from, from the mouth. So good microphones help. Um, the, this kind of microphone I'm wearing now, the, the, um, the, the, the clip-on mic, I find very good quality. Um, it's not always possible to do that, but if you can set up a system with, with clip-on mics, these cost about £15 each, um, then um, yeah, that's not a bad way of getting good quality recordings. Good new tapes of using a tape recorder. These days most people use digital recorders. It doesn't matter, the quality is identical. It's MP3 or better quality. Um, Mini discs, some of you might have still mini disc recorders, but MP3 are the most common these days. And usually they work off plug in cards, the little memory cards that you plug in. Um, and you can, I mean, they come in such big sizes now. The standard ones are you know, two, four gigabytes in size. And they'll keep hours of recording on. So there's no problem about um, the size of those. 
Um, you can use video. I've got the video camera here working and uh, you can use that interviews. But of course, that's more intrusive and more threatening to the respondent than just the sound. And so it, it may not be something that you want to do. Maybe that some respondents don't like it. And of course, their image appears on the video. It's much, more, much harder to, to ensure anonymity and things of that kind. But there might be good reason why you want to do it um, that way. Um, check your equipment, make sure it works. I hope mine works. I've checked it all before I went, came today and, and did it. But again, you know, make sure everything's there, that you've got enough space on your cars to, to record the interviews and so on, that you've got battery power or mains power and so on, if appropriate, etc. Um, and make duplicates. When you get back home, back to your office or whatever, make sure you copy what you've done, that you back up what you've done as quickly as possible so you don't lose it before you do anything else. If you've recorded interviews, you'll need to transcribe them. And I think this is the last slide. Let me say something about transcription. Don't underestimate how long it takes you to transcribe things and how tediously dull and boring it can be. Um, if you have to do your own transcription, and most researchers um, who are students, even research students, have to do their own transcription, unless they're very rich and can pay somebody else to do it. Um, that's the best thing, pay a transcriber to do it, but most times you haven't got the money to do that, so you're doing your own. Actually, there is an advantage to doing your own transcription, which is that you listen to your own data, you get familiar with it, you understand what went on because you were there doing the interviews and so on, so it's actually easier for you to transcribe. But it does take a long time, and I've suggested the fairly common figure is five to six hours per one hour interview. A good typist taking five to six hours for one hour of interview to transcribe it. Um, you can use voice recognition software. Some people have experimented with this to, to avoid the typing. It doesn't make things any quicker. The experience of most people using this is not any quicker, but it avoids having to type. Um, what you can't do is play the voice you've recorded through the software. You have to speak the voice yourself. So you have to listen to it on headphones and then say what the respondent's saying so the system picks up your voice. Um, and of course, when you've done the transcription, check the accuracy of what you've done.